is Maxwell basically electromagnetic theory. And one more limit which I mentioned, which is very important, is this, this wave limit of Ross Petayevsky limit. Where we describe uh, various uh, uh, coherent quantum liquids like superfluids and so on. So what's common about all those limits is that there are certain equations which are typically nonlinear in most of the cases, right? Unlike quantum mechanics, uh, which have unique solution if you have uh, uh, if you specify initial conditions. I have to probably be more careful when I'm saying classical. There are lots of classical systems uh, where we solve some master equations or whatever. In this lecture, for the purposes of this lecture, by classical, I mean classical Hamiltonian. So I'm talking about classical uh, Hamiltonian systems. So, and, uh, uh, well, we know that these limits are very nice, but sometimes we are interested in situations when quantum effects may be still small, but already significant. So like simple examples, which one, one, one might, might one think is that imagine that we have a particle, say, classical heavy particle, which is localized in the bottom of some potential, and suddenly we do a quench. So if you want, this is an example which, which I guess Dan Stucker Kuhn discussed in his lectures about quench in, in spin or condensate from uh, paramagnet to paramagnet. That's precisely the situation. So these two wells correspond to, say, new minima with broken symmetry, for example, for some collective degree of freedom. And initially, we start from a state which is uh, uh, in a single domain. And then if you try to use classical picture, then we just realize that this particle will be stuck on top, so nothing will happen to it. So it's clearly that we have to add noise. Of course, one way is just to say, okay, let's just noise, add noise by hand, and then see what happens. But we will lose a lot of information, at least a lot of uh, uh, quantitative information. But another would be to say that somehow quantum fluctuations are very important in the beginning, because they trigger the motion. But after a while, when particles start to roll down, roll down, it's completely classical picture. By the way, it's exactly the same words people say when they talk about like expanding universe, it's all over approximation. So we need some initial noise to uh, uh, start dynamics, but after that, uh, they become classical. In other examples, you might think about parametric amplifications. You know, if you have oscillator or start changing mass and time, then amplitude will start growing exponentially until some dissipation will stop it. But if you start in the ground state, if there's no temperature, it's a big degree of freedom, then again, you need some seed uh, to start this uh, motion. So purely within classical picture, uh, it doesn't move. And uh, there are the examples, um, and I mentioned some. OK, so uh, 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 because these classical equations of motion are nonlinear, it may need practical applications. We want to apply this uh, method to interacting systems. Uh, you need to solve nonlinear equations of motion. And therefore, for most of the cases, you need a computer. So, that's why I will mostly talk about simple examples here based on the blackboard. I apologize if there are possible mistakes uh, with signs. There are so many, as you'll see, for some brackets, computators, and so on appearing. I just realized when I had the first version of uh, this lecture notes, I wrote that the commutator A dagger and A is 1, not that we did it, that we did it, that we did it, dagger. So if you see something like that, I really apologize. Okay, so now let me just briefly outline what I'm going to talk about. At least this is like my time. So first I talk a little bit about Hamiltonian dynamics, classical Hamiltonian dynamics. Of course you covered most of this stuff in, in the graduate, even perhaps in the undergraduate, uh, school, but because there are some concepts which are very important for me later, and they will be direct generalizations of this classical concept, 
I still want to spend maybe 20 minutes or so going through them. Then I will talk about wave while quantization. This is basically the core of the lectures, at least of, of uh, equilibrium part of the lectures. So it's basically I'll try to present you a complete description of uh, quantum systems in terms of Wigner function while single. I will mention there are other schemes you probably heard about them, like uh, uh, there are Kusimi representations, positive P representations, P representation. They all share all part of this of the same family. So I think if you understand this one with relatively uh, little efforts, you'll understand uh, how other representations work. So, and in particular, I will focus on two limits. I will focus on this. Uh, wave limit, basically, uh, or wave uh, picture phase space and coordinate momentum picture phase space. And I will also talk a little bit about spins. I didn't write this classical limit also, but you know that um, you have uh, classical limits for spins. Then I will go to dynamics, so how we discuss non equilibrium systems. And here I will introduce what's known as uh, truncated linear approximation, this method. And as you will see, it just naturally follows from all the discussion before. So, and then I guess I'll uh, talk about examples. And then, as I said, I was originally planning to tell you to give connections maybe with Keldish technique, talk about the uh, phase space picture, but maybe I should talk about some practical examples just to show how you can apply this method. Okay, yes, I should. Just stop me at any time with any questions. Good. So let me start from a few notions of the classical Hamiltonian dynamics. So as, as you know, the main object here, well, first of all, I have to design a, a, a defined set of canonical variables. Traditionally, we call them P and Q. It's according to momentum. This can be number and phase any conjugate variables, and the Poisson bracket is equal to delta j, and the Poisson mm -hmm. bracket between two other two functions is defined simply as sum of all particles g a g p i g p g q i minus D A D Q I D B D P I. One of the most important objects in, in classical Hamiltonian dynamics. And we can write a shorthand notation for this, right? A lambda B, where lambda will be sometimes called symmetric operator, sometimes syntactic operator. This is this operator which I can write like this. So it's obvious that this works. Now, uh, canonical variables uh, uh, in quantum mechanics and classical uh, mechanics, they play the uh, an exceptional role, it is because all formalism which we develop for canonical variables, it translates to any set of canonical variables. And canonical variables are basically those which preserve this uh, mutation relations. And uh, you might check, for example, and I leave it as an exercise, that if you do some orthogonal transformation and introduce capital P and capital Q, like this, then this will preserve uh, both the structure of this operator, synthetic operator, and the Poisson bracket. So by the way, I, I, I am going through some of the derivations here, like most important, but not all. And through the lecture notes, there are scattered exercises, mostly to complete some derivations. Some of them are relatively straightforward, some of them are less trivial, and if they are less trivial, I give some hints. 
Okay, so uh, uh, you probably know that uh, generally we, cannot, uh, uh, we can define canonical transformations through generating function, but this is a little bit complicated and leads to general. Uh, so let me try to define the infinitesimal canonical transformations. So infinitesimal canonical transformations we can write uh, through some generating function. So let me assume that my Q depends on some continuous parameter lambda, which can be anything. It's some basically it's parameter which parameterizes my canonical transformation. And then I will write as Q of lambda minus some function dA of P Q lambda d P times delta lambda. And then I define P of lambda plus delta lambda. So the P of lambda plus dA, same function A. So you can express this function through generating function. So this is as general as, as like general transformation. But in infinitesimal form, it's, it's a little bit more transparent. So let's just check that, uh, that uh, up to delta lambda squared, we preserve the Poisson bracket. Let me suppress in this as i and j. And in, in principle, you can insert i here, i here, and this uh, full, uh, you use full vector space. So this will be obviously a one, which comes from p and q, plus to the leading term in delta lambda, I have to differentiate one of these guys and one of these guys. Otherwise, I get delta lambda squared. So the only contribution I will get is derivative of this with respect to p and derivative of this with respect to q. So it will be minus d2a dp dq delta lambda. And plus the opposite term, <laughs> derivative of this with respect to p and derivative of this with respect to q. It's one. And this is, as you see, it's the same thing. So this is the same one. So this case might not look very, very, very familiar to you, but you actually know them very well from quantum mechanics. These are generators of translations along my directions. So let me just use an example. A simple canonical transformation will be Q of x will be Q minus x. I have to be a little bit careful what I mean by this. Q is my normal coordinate of a particle, and X is a position in a space if you think it's like position of my ruler. So if I do this transformation, it's going to, to I'm just moving my ruler. So what position was, say, it was one meter from this point, I move my ruler, it's exactly at position zero. So, and, and you might check that uh, you can generate and P of X is the same thing. You can generate this transformation by choosing A is equal to P. So now it sounds really familiar, right? So momentum is a generator in, in, in coordinate space. And this is exactly what happens here. You can just see that if I uh, uh, find, uh, that if I use this, I will see that DQ D lambda is equal to Lambda is my x, so dq dx is equal to minus 1. So q will be q not minus x. So as an optional exercise, I'll leave you to check that if I want to, to, to make a canonical transformation, which is rotation around, say, z-axis, that my a will be just angle momentum uh, with respect to z-axis. So these a's are generators of translations. And now you're probably not surprised that genera generator of translations in time is Hamiltonian. That's what we want. And indeed, this is the case. If we write our Hamiltonian equations of motion, I'll have to check signs. So dq dt is equal to hq, which is equal to dh dp. 
and GP GT will be H times P, the commutator, Poisson bracket H and P minus DH EQ. I just see that if I think about my parameters time, then my uh, H potential is just minus Hamiltonian. So Hamiltonian is a generator of canonical transformations in time. And that's why it's automatically conserves for some brackets. Good. That's basically all I need to know about Hamiltonian uh, dynamics or mechanics, whatever, in uh, coordinate momentum space. But let me do something else now. This is, I guess, okay, can I erase this? I guess I can still use this way. Let me just do something else which is probably not something extremely familiar. So let me uh, take a, a, an oscillator as a modulation. What I'm going to do next is completely decoupled from dealing with oscillator. And let me try to introduce complex variables. So I, I just said that uh, we can do any canonical transformation. It's not forbidden. But let me try to do a particular non-canonical transformation, which you might recognize right away. So I say that P, uh, my momentum, P, is the square root of m omega over 2 of a star minus a. And Q will be 1 over square root of 2 m omega a plus a star. Which we can revert and say that a star will be 1 over square root of 2, q square root of m omega, minus i over square root of m omega times p. Again, I'm suppressing indices. You can do it for each oscillate for each mode. Well, you just didn't know it looks very simple in this. We cannot see that part of the oh, OK. Right. So in these variables, my Hamiltonian is just omega times a star a, which probably looks again familiar, but mostly from quantum mechanics. Okay. I'm not doing anything quantum here. It's just completely classical. So I introduced complex phase space variables. This is not canonical transformation. But let's just check what's the Poisson brackets of these variables. It's simple enough. So obviously, if you compute a a and a star a, star will get zero. The Poisson bracket of anything with itself is zero. So what if we compute Poisson bracket of a and a star? So that's, let's do it carefully. It will be d a d p. So I have to write i over square root of 2m omega times d a star d q. So it's square root of m omega over square root of 2. And then I have to subtract minus d a d q times d a star d p. But I have another minus here. So we just see I just double this. So what do I get? I get i. So while I don't preserve Poisson brackets, I got something very, very simple. That a and a star is equal to i. Moreover, you can check, and again this is an exercise, that if A is multi-component field, if you do any unitary transformation on A, now it preserves this Poisson bracket, this I. So if you say that A goes to some unitary matrix times A tilde or something like that, then A and A tilde will still preserve the same Poisson bracket. So this sort of shows that there is something generic about uh, uh, these operators and the structure, and indeed, A and A star, right? 
just accepting. Okay. And uh, well, these are not exhaustive transformations with result for some brackets. So you can, and you know this, it's a loop of transformation. And uh, it's again, after the next exercise, I, I come to it for a second, again, there is nothing funny about it. So let me just motivate it by this. Introduce coherent state for something. Just because I don't like ice. Coherent state Poisson bracket will be, by definition, sum over all states. Now I introduce the notations. Uh, let me use J. D by D A J. D B D A J star minus D A D A J star D B. Okay. So I'm just motivated by asking that Poisson bracket of Ai and Aj star is just delta Ij. So, yes, so I don't have eyes, and you will see in a second uh, why I'm doing this. So, uh, so we can see from here that I can say, well, we compare just this expression and this expression. We just see that coherent state for some bracket is equal to I times usual for some bracket. So I can obviously also introduce my skew symmetric operator. I'm not writing it. It's exactly the same as as uh, operating according momentum times of uh, uh, picture, but instead of zero with respect to coordinate momentum, I have uh, zero with respect to uh, in this norm. Okay. So now let me try to write down equations of motion. Okay. And now I'm not assuming that I'm dealing with harmonic oscillator. As I said, harmonic oscillator just motivated me to introduce these variables. Once I introduce, I can re-express my Hamiltonian in terms of these new variables. It's like going to a new phase space. Well, I know what to do. For any function, equations of motion look like this. It's dA dt plus I know dA dp times dp dt, but for dp dp, I can write minus dh dq. And then I have dA dq. And instead of dq dt, I write dh dp. So it's just dA dt, partial derivative, plus Poisson bracket of h and t. So now let me apply this to my uh, phase space variables. So I write that d little a dt is equal to, there is no explicit derivative of a in time. Of course, I can consider, I can consider transformations where, say, omega explicitly depends on time. This is like going to move in frame, and it's interesting by the separate story. I'm assuming now I'm dealing with static transformations. So first term drops, and that's what I'm getting is H A, which is the same as I H A coherent. So by multiplying two parts by I, I see that I G A B T is equal to I A H coherent, which is the same as the H the A star. I think this equation should look familiar. This is gross Pitaevsky equation. So just a simple question. Uh, so the Poisson bracket with C is I times the other one, right? There yeah, exactly. So, no, Poisson bracket. Is there anything I understand? Yes. Oh, but I, I changed the order here. So let's see. All right. but not in yeah, I changed the order A and H. Okay, so there's one minus Yeah, sign. there is a minus sign, all right. I multiply by i, I get minus sign, but then I change a and h here. Okay. 
So it's instead of H and A, it's A and H. It's a little bit easier. And then I remember that Poisson bracket coherence is derivative of first with respect to A, second with respect to A star, and vice versa. Again, I can have components here. If I have components, the only thing I do, I just put some index J here and J here. <coughs> I just want to stop here and wait for a second, because you probably all know gross Pitayevsky equation, which appears as some mean field description in some you know, superfluid series, whatever. Um, well, there is nothing mean field about it. You can derive, like Newton equations, you can derive a mean field limit for you know, massive solids when all particles move together. Gross Pitayevsky, you can derive a mean field limit when superfluid is a giant wave. But you don't need to. This is just classical equations in this new phase space wave. So, and as I said, there are no restrictions of what H is to write this equation. Of course, when you use you know, Howard model or something, you would have to use some input um, where everything comes from. Take your bosonic boson creation violation by the quantum mechanically formulated. Yes. So the coherent state half integral. Yes. Then you can just if you look at classical equations of motion, you will get this. Right? Yeah. So that's what well, you're saying. You, but you don't need a condensator and you can just no, no. it's just a subtle point. It's just a subtle point, right. It's it's the same like with Maxwell equations. Of course you can describe lasers with Maxwell equations. There's no question about that. Laser is a condensator of yeah. photons. But you can ask the question, can you describe only lasers with Maxwell equations? The answer is no. So when you go to a regime where you have like, strong interactions and counting is important, then of course this uh, uh, classical picture breaks down. But there is nothing quantum about equations. You can write down this equation, but it may be, it's, it's not a correct description. Yeah, it's like with, with Newton equations. You can write down equation, Newton equations, and try to describe conductivity, and I don't know. No non-interacting distorted electrons and you'll get wrong result just because they're not classical. Okay, so and now the finally what, what, what I, I want to say, uh, yeah, so why I did, I'm, I'm doing it because throughout the whole course I'm doing, I, I'm going to uh, make parallels between two phase space descriptions. So we Mostly in the classical context, for me, there is whatever this coordinate momentum description. But because of, I guess, developments in quantum optics, cold atoms, etc., uh, uh, this equation becomes extremely important as well. So I'm trying to do parallels. And this, of course, uh, as you see, so this is basically I did your second, I don't know, I can't say quantization, second classification, whatever. <laughs> classification. The second classification. So basically, I went to second quantized notations for uh, my classical systems. Uh, and there is nothing quantized, of course. But it's second in the sense that it's dual phase space picture. Not, not coordinate momentum, but uh, rather phase space. OK. So, uh, so finally. Uh, let me uh, write uh, equations for probability distributions, and then I will be done with classical part. So again, we know that probability is conserved. There is nothing we can do about it. So this whole derivative is zero. But on the other hand, this full derivative consists of two contributions. One is partial derivative, so basically how rho changes in time when p and q are fixed. But second, rho changes because p and q change, so it's usual hydrodynamic derivative. I am just using this result, so I know this is, uh, uh, sorry, it's plus h times rho, which I can rewrite as d rho dt is equal to rho h. So again, I can also uh, say that this is uh, uh, i times coherent state bracket multiplied by all i, and get also i d rho dt 
is equal to minus rho and h coherent. So this, uh, well, this is familiar Liu with equation. This would be Liu with equation, which you will write if you have cross Petayevsky dynamics. So, uh, and it's sort of obvious, but I still want to say that this uh, solution is solved by characteristics. So, uh, and this is, if you want, this will be important for us later, what's the interpretation of these classical trajectories, which are, which are given by whatever these Hamiltonian equations. These are just characteristics of probability distribution. So probability distribution is conserved along them. And the other way to say it is that uh, since probability doesn't disappear and they have unique solution, if I want to know what's the probability at point in time to find myself at this phase space point, I just need to trace back uh, what's, uh, what's the point where this motion originated and say probability of that initial configuration. Sorry, can you define rho for us, please? Oh, so rho is the probability. So rho is a function of t and q and t. The probability density to be in particular region of phase space. So if I multiply it by dp dq, this will be really the how yeah. I'm sorry, uh, not the probability much, but let me just use that and you know, this p. That's a good probability. So and usually, again, it's, it's not in, I mean, this is your normal phase space volume. Uh, if you have, if you deal, by the way, with uh, the phase space variables uh, in a star, that instead of dp dq, you will write dA dA star. So it's only its integral over all of phase space that's concerned. No, you are right, but not only because we know what I didn't mention is that this uh, space space volume is also conserved. You can just calculate uh, d gamma dt using this Poisson, whatever this uh, Hamiltonian equations of motion, you'll find it. So this is the famous Liu series. So because d gamma is conserved, it actually means that rho is separate is conserved also. So now quantum mechanics. So um, ideally, I wouldn't raise this stuff, but I guess I will. And you will have your notes in front of you. You can open computer. So uh, I will make parallels with classical results all the time. I don't have space to keep them. So this is a continuity equation, basically. Yeah, exactly. It's just a local continuity. Right, right, right. So now quantum mechanics. Well, quantum mechanics we usually know much better than classical. So we have now coordinate and momentum operators, which satisfy canonical commutation relations. I hope my sign is OK. And they in the endeavor is one. So let me just uh, say two things, only two things about uh, this. So uh, when we deal with operators, of course, we deal with representations. And natural representation in coordinate and momentum, which we almost always use, is this one. And we all know that you can do it the other way around, go to momentum picture. So, and this representation is realized when we use, say, coordinate uh, basis vector. So when we and we write, write our state as some psi of q times q, then precisely the action of coordinate and momentum on this psi will be exactly like this. So if you look carefully into this commutation relation, then you will realize that you can also write something very similar. Uh, you can say that a hat goes to alpha. I don't want to use a because a is reason without hat look too dissimilar. And A dagger goes to minus D by D alpha. So obviously, if we use this, we will uh, satisfy these commutation relations. And the natural states where this representation is realized are coherent states, as we all know. So like if we write our psi, 
integral over d alpha psi of alpha alpha you know coherent state base is over complete so it's always possible to do it there's no unique way to do it but I'll come to that point later so then uh, the action of a dagger on psi will be exactly minus d by d there is one subtlety because you probably know that if you act with a dagger on coherent cell itself, the coherent state itself, you won't get minus sign. But that's because it's a basis vector. When you act on this side, you will get minus one. Okay, so in, in some sense, what I guess uh, uh, here I'm, I'm trying to say is that when we think about uh, uh, phase space representation of quantum mechanics, <coughs> Again, we, in quantum mechanics, we know that we can use this, we can use this as first quantized language, second quantized language. We can describe any system either way. Uh, but when we think about states, natural states, uh, where we, for example, write our pass integral, or where we represent our density matrix, or where we represent our operators, the natural state will be, uh, states will be coordinate when we work in coordinate momentum representation and coherent states when we work in second quantized language. So now, I finally want to introduce what basically this is the main object in these lectures. It's called the wild symbol. So let's imagine that we have some arbitrary operator. And for now, there is no time. I will spend this lecture and probably most of the second lecture, this good half of the second lecture, without talking about dynamics. I'll talk about just space space. So you have some operator. I put, by the way, everywhere hats because I always compare quantum and classical. So uh, otherwise we'll be confused. So hats always imply that I deal with quantum operator. And then I can write a function which depends on Q and P, which is just a partial Fourier transform, the following type. Again, all Q's and, and, and P's are multidimensional. I just want to suppress all the indices. <laughs> so this is sort of an interesting um, transform. And if you look first at it, at this, when I look first at it, I thought it's like a magic. I guess TV gave a lecture here just saying that there is no magic in physics. So the purpose of the last lecture, if I go there, to, to say that there is no magic in doing uh, uh, this here, and if you properly stay on the final path integral, you'll just see that it's there. You don't need to really take it from, from the intuition of some great guy and then just say, let's study this so. But for now, let me use this logic. So let's just take it as granted, and try to look. Well, first of all, we immediately see that something nice about it. It's like in, in classical systems, this is a function of my phase space variables of coordinate and momentum. Moreover, if uh, our h bar is small, then uh, we see that this object uh, will become classical. For example, if omega is just a function of q, if h bar oscillates like crazy, then clearly psi will be localized close to zero. So it means that I will get just my normal uh, omega function. Same with if my omega is just a function of p, I will see that, uh, well, at least close to the classical limit, uh, psi will be localized and then I will get normal function. So it's unique. So we'll be interested in operators where off diagonal elements decay sufficiently fast, so this integral can work. And let's assume that this is always the case. So then it's uniquely defined. So it means for every operator, I can uniquely find what. But what is not unique is the definition. So for wild symbol, it's of course well defined. But in principle, 
I, I can just stare at it and say that, okay, why, why are you doing this symmetric way? For example, I can define omega epsilon of q and p, which is integral of q minus epsilon psi over 2 omega q plus 1 minus epsilon psi over 2. So I'm still taking Fourier transform. But now, I instead of splitting this psi symmetrically between this <coughs> left and right states, and in classical limit, it's clear it doesn't matter how I split it. The only thing which is different is difference between these two states, Q and Q pressure. So I split it anti-symmetrically. So, and it turns out that indeed there is a full family of these representations. And some which are very well studied correspond to epsilon equal to zero and epsilon equal to one. One of them is called P representation, one of them is called Cusimi or Q representation. So this little subtlety, this little epsilon, actually changes uh, the formalism uh, quite a bit. And uh, of course, if you do everything exactly, you don't care. But once you start doing approximations, like particular choice or numerical simulations, whatever particular choice of epsilon can be very important. So in this lecture, I will be talking only about this wild quantization. If you are interested, there is literature, uh, especially in quantum optics, uh, the P and Cosimi representation study be really like to help. Uh, in uh, uh, this coordinate momentum picture, they studied less, but you can still find uh, papers. So do you take into account different quantum effects when we study different representations? So why result can be different? No, the result is different only if you start doing approximations. Uh, so far, I even ah. didn't say what results are. This is definition of my object. Okay, so when you do semi-classic still some models, then you will have different Yes, results. when I start doing approximations, I, I can always define this object, so the question what I do with it, how I compute it, and that's where I also work. Okay, so let, let's just do a couple of, of simple uh, uh, computations. Mm -hmm. Let's take indeed, so omega is just some function only of a coordinate. Well, if omega is a function of, of a coordinate, then it's well simple. It's very simple. If I introduce function of the coordinate here only, I will immediately get delta function, right, because uh, this will be just a number, an overlap of q minus psi over 2 and q plus psi over 2. Oh, I forgot that I'm integrating of psi. So uh, overlap of this 2 is just delta function of psi. I integrate <coughs> delta function of psi, I'll get 1 here. So one symbol of any function of q is just v of q. So in the same way, I am leaving it as an exercise. You can show that for any function of p, you will just substitute uh, p hat by p. So this while symbol definitely, at least in this limit, gives us quantum to classical correspondence. The simplest way to do it is just basically uh, introduce. You get delta function of p, right? I get delta function of psi. Because if this is. Oh, you, you mean. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no. If this is a function of, of p, you will actually it easier to go to momentum representation. And then you will see that this structure will be exactly the same instead of q, I have to use p. But here, you'll get minus sign. And there are some factors of 2 pi and h bar floating around because of normalization. So uh, this one symbol indeed gives us some quantum classical correspondence. So uh, let me try to do a computation for a little bit less trivial situation. Let us compute what will be the wild symbol of the product in Q and P. Well, 
Well, by definition, it's integral of a psi. And I just use this definition. Since q hits my q minus psi on the left, instead of q, I can write just q minus psi over 2. And here I have q minus psi over 2. Q minus psi over 2 is e to the minus plus i psi h plus. Well, this I know how to compute. I insert complete basis of states, k, k. Then operator t, I get x the integral of k over z. Operator t acting on k is just k. And uh, this combination is just e to the minus i k q plus psi over 2. And similarly, k acting on here will be e to the i k q minus psi over 2. So overall, I get e to the minus i k psi. So what I'm getting is integral over g psi dk. I need to put 2 pi h bar. Normalize everything. Q minus psi over 2 times k times e to the i d e minus k psi over h bar. I'm just doing this calculation to show how it works, and there are more exercises. And then I can see that k is nothing but uh, i h bar e by the psi of this e to the p minus r. Right? Because if I differentiate this with respect to psi, I will get exactly minus what we need. So now integral of k is simple. It's a delta function. So what I'm getting is derivative of a delta function. So I will get minus derivative of delta function and impact on this psi. So of overall, what you are getting is that q p plus i h bar water. So when you have non-commuting variables, while well, symbol is a little bit less trivial, but as I was sort of very vaguely arguing, in the classical limit when h bar goes to 0, it becomes still our classical uh, 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 function of q. Similarly, if you compute p times q double, what you will find is q times p minus i h power. But it is a subtle thing with a minus sign. And from here, you immediately see that if you deal with symmetric objects like pq plus qp, then it's well symbol is just classical function, it's just pq. When you deal with anti-symmetric objects, with a commutator, then you will get a quantum part, and as, as we'll see later, it's just Poisson break. So is it because of the choice of the epsilon? So if, if, if I restore epsilon, will I get just epsilon? Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. This epsilon will show up here. So you can remove, for example, completely h bar from here and insert it here. Difference will be always i h bar. But which fraction of h bar you put here and here depends exactly on this parameter of some of the right. So uh, again, as an exercise, uh, uh, you can uh, check uh, that if you have any more complicated symmetric operator, for example, p q squared plus q 2 q p q, I guess, plus u squared p, so it's fully symmetric under all permutation, then it's well symbol is just 44 p q squared. And we sort of know it because we know that symmetric objects correspond to classical correspond to classical objects, and uh, this is in this, uh, this sense. <coughs> well, as you see that this way of computing well symbol looks a little bit messier. So even for the simple object I had to calculate uh, the whole integral and, and 
so on and so forth. But it just turns out that you don't need any of this. And to save time, I will just say it without proof. And the proof is, is very simple, it's just a few lines. Uh, it's essentially the same proof which I used for QP, but you can generalize it for an arbitrary function. Uh, what you can show is that you can use so-called block representation of your operators, which automatically generates your well symbols. This, by the way, block representation was completely obscure. Uh, it's a very hard, at least a few years ago, it was very, very hard to find in literature. Even though people deal with Wigner and wild quantization for a while, I guess it's not even published in the readable literature. It's in some German bulletin, and it's in German. But luckily, there is a very nice review by Hiller and Paul Wigner's course also there, um, uh, where they translate basically. Uh, a bulk paper and give records. What, um, so, what, so what, what, what representation is it? Like what, it's what bulk, sorry, yeah. yeah. Bulk. So far, I met only a single person who knew this name. It was my former advisor in, in Russia, Robert Suris, who probably didn't hear anyway. He, he invented quantum cascade laser. It's very famous. Anyway. It's, it's completely obscure. But the representation, if you see, it's very nice. Right? It's, it's actually very natural. So if you think about it, uh, then the representation which I wrote before, which we normally deal with, I mean, so of course, it's fine when we deal with uh, coordinate wave functions as we usually do. But it's really asymmetric. It breaks symmetry between coordinate and momentum. It's not even clear what the classical limit uh, means there. You have to struggle. Uh, to see that momentum becomes really momentum. Here it's obvious. I didn't just I, I didn't say what these operators mean, but it's obvious that in the classical limit I get what I want. Presumably it should be defined with half, so Q operator is Q half plus I H bar over two D by D P. What is Q half? One half Q. No. No one half so, Well because in the classical limit I want just my Q to be Q. So let's just check this result in one line. Well, I want to compute, as I said, this what operators they generate while simple. Well, instead of uh, doing this fancy, well, maybe not fancy, but still an integral, what I'm doing, I'm just inserting this representation. But then I have to somehow say what, what really derivative means if there is nothing on the right. Well, I just add one here. Obviously, if I add one quantum mechanically, then nothing will happen. So I add one here as well. Well, then it's clear that this is just 0, because d by dq of 1 is 0. So what I'm left with is q times p, and then ih bar d by dp acting on p. Plus i h power with it. Oh, I erased it already. But that's what I had here a few seconds ago. So same, the same way if you have p times q, then we'll get p minus i h power with 2d by dq acting on q. I don't put derivatives and ones anymore. So it's pq minus i h power with 2. So this representation automatically generates your while symbol uh, without need of doing like, any, any integrals or something things. Let me just show that uh, you can do it very easily for like more complicated objects. So suppose I want q squared p squared while symbol. So again, if you do an integral, it will be doable, but it's quite lengthy. So if I use this block representation, so it's q plus i bar over 2 d by dp squared, acting on p squared, it's just a pleasure to take this. Because once you have q squared, you get q squared p squared. 
then you have twice product of q d by dp, but you have extra one half, so this one half disappears. But then you have d by dp on p squared. This gives you two. So you get two i h bar d q, and then finally you get i h bar over two squared, which gives you h bar squared over four, and then second derivative of p is just two. So you get minus h bar squared. So again, we see the same thing, that in the classical limit, h bar goes to 0. This is just my classical object. But uh, then uh, my quantum corrections, they have actually interesting structure. They're always down by extra commutator. So if you think it's like I'm commuting to q and p, I get 1 power q and p less, and I get some coefficient, and so on. So this is like really general structure of any uh, Yes? In simple words, what happens if you do canonical transformation? If I do what? Canonical transformation. Well, this is preserved. So if, if I have, you see, uh, different i's and j's, they just commute. So I, this derivatives, for example, if I have, if I mix, if I do canonical transformation, for example, I mix different components of p, then uh, uh, this structure will be pre I mean, result will change, but. Oh, what was the question? I mean, the question about, double, about the matter double. Does it, how, how, how does it change? Oh, this structure will be the same. Oh, so you're asking what will be if you do canonical transformations? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I need to think about it, because uh, if you preserve, I, I think it will be okay, because if you are, well, let me put it this way. So if your omega is fully symmetric, then nothing will change. Because if you have fully symmetric, you just use, use quantum classical correspondence. But what if I, for example, in, in this uh, omega of p times q, right. if I change q to q plus x and p stays the same, an example as you just did, it seems to change. If p, yes, but it will be probably the same change as you have here, right? Because if you change here also, q goes to q plus x, you'll get also extra contribution here. So you'll get the same changes in classical uh, system. So again, the argument, I, I don't know the result at the top of my head, but the argument will be like this. Suppose I write my uh, 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 operator in a fully symmetrized form. If I have fully symmetrized form, that they can do arbitrary canonical transformations as soon as I do the same transformations on classical variables, I just substitute uh, my, my basically new variables into this uh, function and I get new function. And these functions do not have to be conserved in the canonical transformation, right? As you'll notice. Uh, but then uh, what you can see is that any operator can be written as sum of uh, symmetrized operators. It's like, you know, any operator can be written as sum of normal ordered operators. So this is called not normal ordering, while ordering, or symmetric ordering. So therefore, this statement sort of translates. Uh, so, so this expression over here uh, for this, the, like sort of the square of arbitrary power isn't like super nice, like it's not just this, the other result squared, but is the, if I wrote by trying to solve it for the symmetrized form, like p squared q squared, is the, is the sum of it? No, no, no. Symmetrized is actually slow. symmetrized. Yeah. You have to build slowly. So yeah. it, it's, it's like this. So you write qp plus pq. In order to get oh, symmetrized okay. force, you just multiply on q on the left plus multiply on q on the right. So that would be a symmetrized form. And then you do the same, but multiplying on p both on left and right. And then you add them, you'll get them on some bunch of them. Really for an arbitrary towers of p and q, for this the same way there is for like uh, the commutation relation? Uh, yes, yeah, sure, because yeah. if you think you can get those from combinatorics. Okay. From the Bob operator, you just have binomial coefficients. And I, again, I don't remember it from top of my pen, but it's a very yeah, simple calculation. Cool. From combinatorics, you can always say. But you also, I guess my point is you only get the nice like the nice stuff from the fully symmetrized one, right? Or well, you have to be careful. You have to be what, what you call nice. As you know, commutators, they're also nice. Yeah. For commutators, if you consider yeah, a commutator, yeah. you'll get just p times q. For commutator becomes a Poisson bracket, which is in a way also nice. Okay. Yeah, but it's true that it, 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 you usually want to have some structure. OK, how much time? OK, good. 
Can I yeah. Can I take up these as the, the Moyo product extension? Oh, you are too far. Uh, actually, next I wanted to introduce Moyo products. Right? Thank you. So once we define this, it's nice, but we know that with operators, we know rules how to operate with them. So, and uh, we usually what we do, we can sum operators or multiply operators. So multiply by them. Obviously, if we take uh, one symbol of the sum, this will be just sum of all symbols. It just obvious from the definition. What about the product? And for the product, again, I just state results like with both operators. And there are hints of the proof. Proof is left as an exercise. It's not a very simple proof. Um, but I, I gave hints how you can, you can derive. So basically, the statement which I say without any proof, that if we have some two operators, omega 1, omega 2, and we want to compute wild, oh, sorry, uh, wild symbol of the product of the operator, then this is nothing but a to the minus i h bar over 2 lambda times omega 2. And lambda is this Q-symmetric operator which appears before. It's basically for some reason. So instead of proving this, I'll just check that this works for this example which, which I just released. You have the result. So let me just compute wild symbol of E times P, Q times P, using the third way of doing it. Not integral, not block representation, but the model product. And then I hopefully from here you will see what's the meaning of this exponent. So this I can write as Q, because while symbol of Q is just Q, times e to the minus whatever lambda. But we don't know how to deal with exponents in general. So we just expand it. It's minus i h bar over 2 lambda plus dot 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 times p. Why I don't care about dots? Because dots involve higher orders of lambda. They involve higher order derivatives. There is nothing which allow me to have non-zero high order derivative. So at the end, I have to stop at the first order. First will give me Q times P. And second will give me just nice Poisson bracket with Q and P with a minus sign. Well, OK, it's Poisson bracket of Q and P, which is minus 1. So it's just plus I H bar over 2. If I change P and Q, obviously I will get minus I H bar over 2 squared. So let me do the same again for Q squared P squared. again q squared. Now I have to expand it up to a second order in lambda. Minus h bar squared over 8 lambda squared times p squared. So first term is obvious, it's q squared p squared. Second, my I have to choose, remember that lambda is d by dp, d by dq minus opposite. I have to choose the opposite, because I have only Q on the left. And if I choose the opposite, I'll get minus sign, I get one half, I get two from here, two from here, I get two I H bar Q P. And from lambda squared, I will get second derivative here, second derivative here, I get two times two, one over eight, I get minus H bar squared two. Same result. What's this uh, called? Moa? It's Moyle, yes, on the can It's called Moyle for I think Alex should have used it because in Keldish technique we always it's used all the time. So he definitely introduced the uh, this you know, the, the last line of lambda omega one, omega two. Okay. Okay. So and then I can write like this. This just I, I don't know if it completes if you want the rules of algebra of operating with, with operators, now it means that once I have these rules, I can basically construct wild symbol of an arbitrary operator starting from elementary operators. Uh, so again, we explicitly see that in the limit h bar goes to zero, 
model product becomes normal product, as we expect. Now, if we look into, say, omega 2, omega 1, opposite order, then we will obviously get the same result, but with 2 and 1 change. But now let's observe that lambda is Q-symmetric. So if we change omega 1 and omega 2 and lambda to minus lambda, we'll get the same result, right? Because lambda was whatever. It was d by dp acting on the left, d by dq on the right, minus the opposite. So if we change left and right operators and change lambda to minus lambda, we'll get the same result. So this is the same as omega 1 times e to the ih bar over 2 lambda times omega 2. So now we can compute commutator. So commutators are very important. So the while symbol of the commutator It's called, uh, it is, uh, let me just get it right, it's minus 2 omega 1 sine of h bar lambda over 2 omega 2, which is, I will write this formally as minus i h bar omega 1 omega 2 model bracket. So that's what known in literature as model bracket and which is so and we define omega 1, omega 2 model bracket as uh, 2 over h bar sine of h bar over 2 times lambda of omega 1. So basically, a model bracket, which is <coughs> commutator in simple words, there are some factors ih bar, which is just taken out for convenience. Convenience, basically, model bracket is a commutator. Commutator in this language is just basically sign of Poisson bracket. So we just see that in the classical limit, h bar is small. I can expand, they can linearize it. And this becomes normal Poisson bracket. So in this sense, we just see that commutator becomes uh, Poisson bracket plus high order corrections, uh, which start from H cube. I'm almost done with preliminaries. I know it's a little bit heavy, but I, uh, I saw that I cannot go with applications before I. I I'll try to speak louder. Than I have ten minutes left. Uh, before going to all this machinery. Hopefully tomorrow we'll start seeing how this machinery just pops up and give uh, gives nice results. But few more preliminaries before. Them. So uh, I, I introduced both operators. Let me just finally introduce another type of left moving both operators in this space. I can also say that the same Q can be written as minus ih bar over 2 d by dp, where derivative acts on them. And it's sort of like differentiating or integrating by parts. Well, you can just check that if you use this qp, it doesn't matter whether you uh, have derivative with plus sign d by dp acting on this p, you give plus h bar over 2. Or if you have derivative with plus sign d by dq acting on the left, you'll get the same result. I wouldn't probably mention it. This is just, I don't know, who cares? You can use this, you can use this. Except that once we go to non-equilibrium systems, the choice of each representation to use is extremely important. It's dictated by causality. So if you want, you always want to choose earlier derivatives. Just looking ahead into time, uh, so once you talk about non-equilibrium systems, you'll interpret this Bob operator as a response. So this Q at the time t will be Q of t plus d by dp of t. So you'll interpret this as junk 
in momentum at time t. And then when you evaluate response at a later time, it will be response to this particular jump. And there, you always want to preserve causality. You don't want to, to study responses uh, to jumps which occur in the future. You lose causal structure. Mathematically, it's okay, but physically, you don't want Okay, so uh, just to finish. Yeah, question? No. To finish this part in the coordinate representation, I promise I will be faster in, in, in um, uh, here in state representation. Uh, let me just, on passing, introduce another ingredient of this formula, which is a Wigner function. But this another important ingredient is nothing but a wild transform of the density matrix. I'm not changing any single line in this expression. So I just define wild transform of the density matrix as the Wigner function. So we can immediately see that this Wigner function is properly normalized. Won't write it, but let's just think if we integrate over <coughs> dp, dp over whatever 2 pi h bar. So here it's obvious that once we integrate over P, we'll get a delta function, delta of xi, and the remaining integral of Q will be just trace of the density matrix. So it's normalized. Moreover, if you want to calculate, uh, for example, expectation value of coordinate, also you want to calculate Q power n or any power of coordinate. Then we know what we have to do is to, well, let's just basically check that this is the same as an integral over d2 dp over 2 pi h bar into q and p times q of h. This is again obvious because if you just stare on these two lines, so if you integrate this object W of Q and P and Q power N multiplied by P, you still get a delta function of P. So the remaining part is just trace of Q power N and density matrix in the coordinate representation. So this is exactly expectation value. So we see that uh, uh, our Wigner function uh, uh, starts to look like some probability distribution, some row which I introduced before. Moreover, if you try to do the same calculation for p power n, you'll find exactly the same result. This will be integral of p power n uh, weighted with a Wigner function. And what you can prove, and this proof I will show you because it's very quick, that in general, expectation value of any operator can be computed using Wigner function. So omega of whatever Q and P arbitrary operator is nothing but the integral over dQ dP over 2 pi h bar W Q and P times wild symbol of this operator. So this basically com completes uh, this uh, quantum classical correspondence. Because before I was just telling uh, that we can introduce this object, which are well symbols, which are nice, but who, who knows what they mean. But now I'm just saying that if you want to calculate any observable, so far there's no time, so it's any equilibrium observable, then, well, time can be encoded in density matrix. Anyway, so if I want to calculate any observable, I just take my wild symbol and weight it with Wigner function and integrate. It's exactly what we will do in classical physics <coughs> mechanics. So let me. I guess I will skip the proof. Uh, I mean, 
when you have to when you work with the density matrix, you just doing a coordinate coordinate representation, you know, QQ prime representation. Yes. And you take a multiply to make that observable by a density matrix of a trace. So this is sort of a rotated version of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is precisely how the proof goes. So once you have this, basically if you multiply this by this, okay. have, they have different size but common P. Once you create over P, you will see that one side is minus the other side. And if one side is minus the other side, you will immediately see that, uh, uh, anyway, so what you will see is that this will be the integral of QQ prime of what you said. Uh, Q omega Q prime, Q prime rho Q, and when you integrate over Q prime, it will be just trace of omega. <clears throat> so, okay, so what are the properties of the Wigner function? Well, that it's normalized, so this is a nice thing. What's not nice about this Wigner function is that it's not positive in general. And if it's not positive, while well, this is exact, it's not very useful because you have to, we're always thinking about multidimensionally, if we think about many particle problems, uh, just averaging any function uh, with, with respect to something which oscillates, it's not very easy. But there is a special class of systems, which are, of course, harmonic systems, where Wigner function is very simple. So, of course, if I would aim to develop this formula just to study harmonic systems, I wouldn't be here. There are probably 10,000 ways of looking at it. But uh, 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 you, there is a big class of problems where, for example, you might think about the initial state as harmonic, and then uh, you look into data. Or what you can think about is that for initial state, some equilibrium state, you know it's sufficiently simple. Uh, for dynamics, and you know how to develop approximations for Wigner functions. I'll mention a couple of them. As usual, you can find best Gauss theorem, the final operational principle, and so on. So you don't need to find the uh, Wigner function. But suppose you, you know how to find it accurately. But then you study dynamics towards complicated region. And then you, there is no even close possibility of finding Wigner function. And uh, uh, you'll have to study this whole logic. But for harmonic systems, it's simple, so let me just illustrate it. So let me just take harmonic oscillator. And as we know, it's, I'll consider Gauss state for now. Its wave function is 1 over you know, 2 pi in mod squared, I guess. I mean, if I miss some factors here, I won't blame it minus q squared over 4 a naught squared where a naught is postulated length so it's square root of h bar over 2 and one. Now let's just calculate what their given uh, function is. Omega q and p. Well, I have to sandwich my wave function between coherent states uh, uh, sorry, uh, between uh, this coordinate states. So what I have is uh, integral over big psi, 1 over 2 pi a naught squared power 1 half, times I get e to the minus q minus psi over 2 squared over 4 a naught squared, times e to the minus q plus psi over 2 squared over 4 a naught squared times e to the i of x i over So you just see it's a very simple Gaussian integral. Q part just uh, it decouples completely. I have q squared over 4 a naught squared, q squared over 4 a naught squared. So what I'm getting is uh, the sum factor of 2 from the integration. I didn't mess up. And then something which you would probably expect you want to write a simple Gaussian. It's, it's a product of two Gaussians in coordinate and momentum. 
and P0 is nothing like H bar over 2 H0. So they, of course, satisfy minimum certainty. So I told you that uh, Wigner functions are not positive in general, and I'll show later examples when, when they're not. But uh, a particular system uh, of a harmonic oscillator, of a ground state of harmonic oscillator, or a ground state of any harmonic system, disordered, non-disordered, doesn't matter, as soon as you can write it as sum of normal modes, is a simple Gaussian. Moreover, again, as an exercise, you can generalize this calculation. And I suggest you to do it. It's not totally trivial exercise. You can define a, a Wigner function for any thermal ensemble. So basically, harmonic oscillator in a thermal state, in finite temperature state. And it turns out it's still a Gaussian. And this is this explicit expression is this to the minus <coughs> If you do this exercise, you can try to expand this in powers of e h power over two t. Or actually, the easiest way to do it is to go to second quantized language. Anyway, so because if you work with Hermit polynomials, I think you. It's very messy. But the final result is very simple. So it's still a Gaussian, and it's almost the same thing like at zero temperature, but except I'm getting these familiar terms like cotangent of h bar omega over 2t. So when temperature is small, my cotangent is 1, cotangent is 1, tangent is 1, so overstay come back. But what happens in the high temperature limit? So can you guess what the result will be without sort of doing any calculations. So suppose I take temperature which is much bigger than h bar omega. Boltzmann, Boltzmann function, precisely. So, uh, and the way to see it is that uh, this cotangent is, remember, it's cosh over sinh. Cosh of zero is basically one. So you get sinh on top, which is h bar omega over 2t. But remember, a, a uh, well, a not squared also contains h bar, so h bar disappears. And what you get is, uh, if, you, if you do it, is q squared m omega squared. And from here you get p squared over m. And this is, uh, I think to me it's sort of very interesting result. This is, by the way, I believe generic. I, I didn't see a proof in literature, but I, I, I'm pretty sure it, it, it exists. Then uh, this Wigner function, it interpolates between classical Boltzmann distribution and whatever quantum result is. And uh, just from this whole description, you will see that in general, uh, it will be very, very hard to separate quantum and classical effects and time finding temperature. Because it will be very hard to say which part of the Wigner function is classical, which is quantum. You, uh, you, you can, of course, represent it as product of some classical Wigner function times whatever you may mean, but it's, it's very ad hoc. And uh, it will probably depend on, on the choice. So, in this sense, we just see that uh, this whole uh, picture, which I'm trying to represent, it sort of naturally uh, unites three fields. So, we have classical mechanics, we have quantum mechanics, but we also have statistical physics. Yeah, I think I should be stopping now. So next time I will continue with coherent state representation, doing a little bit of this, and then we will go to dynamics and hopefully examples, and you will see that I'm not just doing mathematical games with no purpose.